Erica, let's start with Nancy Pelosi. The first time you met her, what was she like? What was her reputation by the time you come to town in 2001? Is she considered to be someone who hangs out with Republicans? I mean, what's she like? Well, I, I think, first of all, anytime you think about Nancy Pelosi, you have to give her credit. She broke barriers. She became the first woman Speaker of the House. And I think that is a historic uh, note to, to make sure we recognize. Um, I, I, listen, Nancy Pelosi was never uh, an individual that extended her reach across the political aisle. Uh, everything that I know and came to know about Nancy Pelosi and working with her over 14 years was that she was uh, iron-fisted in her partisanship uh, and frankly didn't need or see the need to develop relationships across the aisle with Republicans. Analyze her as starting as a whip and in her leadership talents. What she bring to bear? Why? I mean, she's well known for keeping her caucus together and such. Um, why? Well, I, I think the uh, she Nancy Pelosi. I think when she began her ascension in the leadership of the Democratic Party back in the early 2000s, up until she became Speaker and throughout the first term as in her Speakership when I served with her, uh, and then when she became Minority Leader when I became the Majority Leader, there was um, a sense that she did have firm control on her troops. But again, those were days in which she had about a 30 member majority uh, in the House, very, very different than today. Uh, and I think perhaps the skills that she demonstrated were much more applicable to that environment than they are to the environment today, uh, which is, I think, an explanation for why she's had so much trouble this term under the Biden administration with the majority that she has being so slim. The skills that you talk about, the, um, the partisanship that she has, where does she inherit that from? I mean, she, her background is she comes from Baltimore, of course, the famous family and her dad and mayor, and um, a very partisan politics is played in Baltimore. And then she moves to San Francisco, which is, of course, a very liberal um, city, and so she never had to deal with Republicans to, to a large extent. Um, how, how is that defined by how she gets here? Is it partly uh, one of the reasons why she has a lot of success in r rising the ranks of the leadership in the Democratic Party? I, I don't think there's any question that uh, given today's uh, uh, sort of the evolution of politics in the early 2000s up through today, so over that 20-year period of time, uh, we have seen increasingly the amount of partisanship uh, and resulting polarization uh, both in Washington, which reflects the same throughout the country. And Nancy Pelosi is a fierce warrior in the partisan battles in Washington. Uh, she really, I believe, carries a disdain uh, for my party in, in its opposition to what she's trying to achieve. And frankly, I experienced it uh, when I became whip uh, and then leader uh, in having to deal with her. She is resolute in her, in, 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 in her temperament, uh, and her attitude towards having to work with Republicans. Uh, and if you can recall during the Bush years, uh, Nancy Pelosi almost didn't want to be considered as um, a leader in the House. She wanted to be considered leader in par with the president himself. And so there was this disdain and almost arrogance that she carried about herself, I think, which either purposely got in the way of uh, her finding relationships that she could rely on across the aisle, which really are non-existent. Where, where does that come from? I, look, I have to believe it comes um, from this uh, story about her upbringing, where she uh, grew up in the political wars in, in the city of Baltimore. Uh, and these were some, I, I, I don't know, I didn't live there. I just read about what her upbringing was and certainly the reputation of her family, the D'Alessandro family in Baltimore. Um, I just have to believe that that real partisan fighting edge was developed early on for her. Uh, and that manifested itself now today, and I think was probably very attractive to some of the left and the intense feelings that the progress now progressive left has uh, towards um, towards my party and anything that uh, sort of stands for uh, sort of the free market capitalism that I stand for. 
So let's talk about the Bush years and, and sort of continue the, down the, the, the track you were, you were on. Um, Iraq, of course, she comes out very strongly against Iraq. She comes back um, and really hits Bush early on um, for the issue of Iraq. She's unafraid to, um, I mean, early in those early days, really unafraid to play the game of partisan politics. I mean, what, what is she doing? How do you see her at that point? Well, I, I think, that, you know, looking back, you can see that, you know, she's very strategic and took as close to an absolute opposition position as she could and was not in, interested in assuming the gray zone. She was all about the black and white, all about delineating um, the, the positions of, the, of her party versus mine. And as I said before, she was interested in going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the president in the White House, not toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody in Congress. 2006 uh, midterms, the uh, Iraq issue is a, a prime issue. They, they, um, Nancy Pelosi uses it uh, very efficiently and then very successfully. Why was that and uh, what was the effect on, on her career? What was going on then is, is after the Bush re-election uh, in 2004, certainly the country became tired and, and weary of uh, the ongoing war in Iraq and Afghanistan at that point. And I think politically, nobody says that Nancy Pelosi is not astute in terms of a Democrat partisan. Uh, and she saw very quickly where the intensity in her caucus was. And so she assumed this strong opposition uh, to anything in the Bush White House. Uh, and I think it was a precursor for where we are today uh, in the divide that exists uh, between the two parties and, frankly, that which has divided the country. And the effect on her career? Well, I think that at the time, um, I, I do think that the country in 2000, um, uh, you know, experienced a very, uh, very, very close election, the Bush v. Gore election that had to be decided by the Supreme Court. And I think ever since then, we have seen a very closely divided country. Uh, and with the advent of social media and all the forces that have come in to um, a exaggerate and magnify that divide, I, I think the constituencies of both parties are looking to their representatives in Washington to fight. Uh, and it almost now has become more about the fight than it is about the substance. And she saw early on that the harder she fought, the more attractive she was as a leader uh, for, her mem for her caucus members so they could go home and, and represent to their constituents that they're fighting hard every single day and not giving an inch. Uh, again, with very much prescient, I think, uh, to where we are today. But Nancy uh, saw that early on. Uh, and look, I say again, there are consequences to uh, assuming that method of leadership when you've got a Congress the way you have now that is so closely divided, where she is now being held hostage by her own and has nowhere to turn because she has zero relationships on the other side of the aisle. Talk a little bit about the financial crises and what happened and, and how she you know, um, how she was involved and, 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 and this idea that she learned some lessons that she couldn't trust Republicans because of it. Well, in 2008, um, when, the, when the collapse occurred with uh, Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns and AIG, all of that, when the financial crisis brought on by um, the, uh, the, the housing crisis and the mortgage crisis, um, there was a very um, strong message sent by the Bush administration to the Hill. At the time, I was the chief deputy whipped and then Roy Blunt, uh, and John Boehner had become uh, the minority leader. President Bush was still in office in his last year. There was an election ongoing with President Obama and John McCain, and I remember being at a meeting at the White House, and um, the message was very clear that, uh, you know, we all needed to join together. Or we, we wouldn't necessarily know what the future would bring. So, you know, I, I, I remember having to hustle up the votes on the floor, and the first time that the TARP vote happened um, on the floor, it went down. Uh, and I'm not sure that if Nancy uh, was all in at, the, at that point and whether her caucus was all in, but we quickly um, regathered as a Republican caucus to make sure that we could deliver those votes. Uh, again, not knowing uh, what the future was to bring, and given the fact that we had the president and uh, then Secretary Paulson telling us 
We had no choice or else our constituents may wake up the next morning without anything in their IRAs. Uh, it was that type of a moment. So I'm not sure that Nancy um, you know, learned any lessons, uh, yes or no, but she did in her caucus uh, step up and, and help us get that pass at the time. So the, the way the story goes, there was an agreement to, well, Pelosi said, I can get this number of votes. And, and Boehner said, I, I'll get this number of votes. And then Boehner didn't get the number of votes. And, and the lesson learned, according to people that wrote about Pelosi or, or close to Pelosi, is that she has learned a lesson here if she hadn't learned it before, which is the fact is, is that um, she, you can't trust the, the GOP, whether in the minority or, or the, the majority, and that if you've got the votes to do it yourself, get it done, and that way you'll get more of what you need, um, and um, you don't have to dither and dather. Well, I, I don't think that's true because, I mean, look, at the end of the day, TARP was passed with a bipartisan vote. I mean, without Republicans, um, Nancy couldn't have delivered that vote. So the fact that it didn't work the first time, uh, I remember specifically, I had to go back as Chief Deputy Whip uh, with Roy Blunt at the time. We had to go twist some arms uh, and get the members who were unwilling to do this on our part go and get them to step up. But Nancy didn't have the votes. So, again, I'm not sure that that was any pivotal uh, vote for her. I just think, listen, she's just very steeped uh, in this partisan warfare, always has been. It's come to roost now. It's come to roost now because she's really unable to uh, wield her caucus. And the fact she's almost been set up, you know, by the press and others uh, for failure at this point because she has been reputed to be this mastermind negotiator, uh, whip of her caucus and the rest. Uh, and when she says something, you can take her word to the bank, so to speak, is what has been written about her. But I think what we've seen is over this Congress, there have been several instances in which she announces a vote. We're absolutely going to take this vote this week and we're doing X, Y, Z and it doesn't come to pass. And I think that has happened over so many weeks and months at this point. Even the press corps, which has been so fawning over Nancy Pelosi, is now beginning to really doubt um, her prowess. And I think this all goes back to sort of the method of operation and the severe partisanship that she assumes. And it just doesn't work uh, when you have no room to maneuver and even your own uh, members can join in coalition to block you. Uh, and again, she has no relationships on the other side of the aisle to turn to. Just put that, uh, that moment of time, that vote, in sort of a, a, a looking back sort of way of how we should view it. I mean, it, it certainly seemed to have been a turning point in politics in America, that the, you know, the Tea Party began becoming more powerful, the, uh, the right to occupy people on the left uh, was becoming more uh, um, powerful. There was a more of a division within both parties. Did you see that as sort of, there was a, a, yeah, a before TARP and an after TARP kind of thing? Look, I do think that the financial crisis, we're still feeling the aftermath of the financial crisis. And I think that the fact that Washington stepped up uh, and targeted relief through the big money center banks Again, ultimately, the reasoning was we didn't know if they collapsed where that would leave the everyday Americans and their retirement accounts and their portfolios on the stock exchanges. We didn't know. And so, but I think it provided an opening uh, for uh, the almost illiberal socialists on the left, as well as the populists on the right, to begin to ascend in terms of their appeal to the populace. There's no, no question about it. I mean, I remember even uh, Barack Obama himself gave credence to the Occupy Wall Street movement and, and repeatedly talked about the 99% versus the 1%. This has come from the President of the United States. And certainly Nancy Pelosi, with her caucus, was going to jump on that bandwagon too and assume the mantle of a fighter for the people. Uh, and so, yes, I do believe in this country. The divide that we saw in 2000 had a little bit of a receding moment during the Iraq War and after 9-11. But clearly, as the country began to grow tired of that, and then we are upon the financial crisis, there was clearly now a deepening fissure in this country post the great financial crisis. 
So let's talk about ACA and, and the health care debate. Um, Nancy Pelosi and, and, and Obama had very different views of how to use power and how to move forward with this. She said that she thought that um, Obama misread the Republican Party on, on ACA, that he was, he was naive, that he, he, she kept on saying, you're not going to get the votes. We have to go forward uh, and do as, as powerful a job, make it as big and, as, and do it as quick as we possibly can. Um, again, coming back to the idea that you can't trust Republicans. What, what did you see as sort of the, that relationship and, and possibly a division between how she saw the way forward and, and, and President Obama saw it? Well, first of all, let's remember, uh, it was um, first uh, during that year when Obama first got elected post-financial crisis, the first big undertaking was their stimulus bill. And at the time, it was a nearly $1 trillion bill to try and address um, the fallout after the great financial crisis. Uh, and that, that was a bill that spoke to the economy. That was a bill that, uh, frankly, we were excluded from in terms of negotiations as Republicans. And at that point, after Obama issued his famous line to me in the Roosevelt Room, you know, elections have consequences, Eric and I won. You know, we, we at that point knew we were not going to be a part of anything that the Democrats did. Obama came in with 70-some percent approval rating. Pelosi had supermajority, 30-member majority in the House. There was a 60-vote Senate Democratic majority. Uh, we knew at that point we weren't getting anything, and they demonstrated that in that stimulus bill. But if you recall... Barack Obama wanted to start with the health care bill, which, uh, you know, looking back was not the time to do that because the country was reeling from the financial crisis um, from an economic and job standpoint. But Nancy Pelosi, she wanted to introduce and she brought up a cap and trade bill in the House. Uh, and that was her issue to want to go in and undertake again in a strictly uh, uh, partisan basis, knew her caucus members and the far left wanted to embark upon this uh, agenda of cap and trade during a financial crisis. But again, so there was a real mismatch as far as what she and the Obama administration wanted to do. So I, I wasn't in the discussions with Nancy and, and President Obama at the time, but I assume she had the uh, ability to determine the agenda in the House. And so they went and tried to do tra cap and trade, which didn't go anywhere in the Senate. And then after that started the real discussions around the Obamacare ACA bill. Uh, you know, and I'll never forget the Obama administration came to me, um, Nancy Ann DePaul, who at the time was the woman in charge of the Obama health care agenda, and came into my office, and I was the Republican whip, and asked if we were going to be a part of what they were doing. And I said, well, we've certainly gotten burned on the stimulus, so you got to tell me how it is that you're going to prove that you want our help, because otherwise it's, it's futile to sit here and discuss. And when we got into the substance um, of, the, of the bill, um, it was in the House, um, uh, even the White House had joined with Pelosi in insisting that there would be a government option under the ACA, which essentially, uh, if we remember that term, was um, for choices for Americans and, and, and for people who wanted um, some health insurance, you could opt for a government option versus the private sector. And in my mind, I knew that my members and the members of the Republican caucus said, hey, why are we having the government regulate the private sector, but then again, also be a competitor to the private sector? It didn't make any sense to me wasn't going to bring down costs, as we know government can't do that well. Uh, and so I told them, I said, we can't do that. That is a deal breaker for us. So at that point, the White House was following what Nancy Pelosi wanted to do and jamming everything they wanted. They weren't getting our help. And as we saw what happened is they never got that in the Senate anyway. Uh, so I'm not so sure that, um, you know, it was, it was Nancy that knew the better way. Um, but um, it wasn't as if they were, um, you know, that the White House was necessarily listening to Nancy or not. I mean, she did what she wanted. So what do you, what's your perspective on the this, this story that, you know, after Scott Brown wins and, um, and they're all of a sudden thinking, oh, my God, we're going to have to go small. And Rahm Emanuel was talking to the Democratic caucus saying, we'll go small if we have to and blah, blah, blah. And she goes to the White House and says, no, 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 we're not going small. We're going big. We have to go big. If you don't go big and you go small, you can count me out in trying to push this thing forward. If you go for it, I'll be involved. Um, but th th that she was the one that sort of drove 
Yeah, this, uh, again, this is, I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm following the same history books that maybe you are because th they had no choice. They couldn't go big or small. They had to deal with what they were given, period. They weren't going to get Republican support. Uh, and so that's why we ended up with the mess of the ACA that it was because it was never brought into a conference to uh, clean up, if you will, the provisions um, at odds. Um, uh, that didn't make sense. And that's, I believe, why we've had this succession over the years of court challenges, unsuccessful as they were, but there was a lot of gray area left. So there was no ability for Nancy to say yes or no. It was what it was. There was no option. They couldn't do anything other than take what they had, pass whatever they could try and get. So there was no, there really wasn't a lot of option at that point. The consequences of it, well, of course, by the time we get to the 2010 uh, elections, is, um, is pretty dire um, for the Democrats, and she loses her, her speakership. But the, 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 thing, the other thing that happened in the 2020 elections is, is um, she took offense of the way the GOP dealt with her. There was $70 million worth of, of uh, ads and stuff that were run about Nancy Pelosi around the country. There was the famous bus, you know, Dump Nancy, that was, it was all over the country. Um, there was a concerted effort to use Nancy as sort of the, the figurehead of the Democratic Party. Um, why, why was that, instead of going after Obama, in fact? Um, uh, so why was that? Was that a smart political move? Well, listen, we went after Obama, too. There was no question. Obamacare was the thing that carried us into the majority. Uh, and Nancy was a big part of allowing that to happen. Uh, and it was these, you know, she's got this uh, no-holds-barred attitude that she's going to go run the tables and the other side be damned. Uh, and that came to cost her the majority in 2010. Uh, I don't think this country likes these extreme shifts one way or the other. We've certainly seen that over the last decade, that increasingly now Washington changes hands a lot more frequently than it used to. Uh, again, because of the fickle electorate, and I also think because of the lack of ability to get together uh, and come up with a consensus rather than just do it my way or the highway. Uh, I think Barack Obama was a huge cause um, of that, uh, because the last time we ever got together was under Bush after 9-11 and, and how this country did come together then. After that, we have not seen that type of bipartisanship since in any big way. One of the things that has been brought up, which is fascinating, is that she at some point, I think it was 2006, told her caucus, you will not sign on to bipartisan yes. bills. What, what, what was that all about, and what, what did that say? This was all part of her 6 for 06 agenda, I remember. And, you know, it was very clear. Again, uh, Nancy Pelosi, very single-minded, very partisan, not interested in solving any problems, but in fighting the war. Uh, very attractive to her members, uh, especially those in the intense far left. Uh, and from San Francisco, representing those values, that was very attractive to Republicans to go and exploit because she is very much out of sync with the mainstream of this country. And the idea of not allowing bipartisanship on bills? Yeah, when well, Nancy Pelosi, um, you know, send the word out to her members that um, they shouldn't be cooperating at all with the other side, just like she didn't, uh, because they didn't want to give our members any shot at claiming legislative victories in the political game. Uh, and so, yes, yeah, she's no holds barred politician that was about partisan warfare 100% of the time. Rahm Emanuel helped put that on steroids for her on the floor of the House in 05 and 06, uh, which allowed them to, to win back the majority uh, in, uh, uh, in that year. Trump comes in. What was her role with, with Trump? How did she deal with him? The battle between that started almost immediately. I mean, there's the, the story of the, the first meeting where they get together and President Trump says a few things about the idea that he would have won the, the, uh, the overall vote in the election and that she calls him on it and says, Mr. President, you've got your facts wrong. And so almost immediately, uh, they were up against each other. What did you see in that relationship? Well, Nancy Pelosi has been very consistent in her, uh, in her MO, uh, year in, year out. She is a partisan warrior, and she saw in Trump somebody to come up against uh, as, as, as an equal. Again, he's the president. Uh, she's the Democratic leader, uh, and she's, she is um, somebody he has to reckon with. 
she didn't give up any opportunity to make a real spectacle of that. Uh, ultimately, you know, they were successful in, in limiting his tenure to one term, but it was this, this, again, absolute dedication to the partisan fight. In and out, forget about the solution, forget about the country, we are about the partisan warfare. Um, by 2018, um, they win big. She uh, will eventually become speaker again. Uh, but she has some, within her own party, uh, uh, a group of moderates come after her saying, you know, you, you've had your time. What, that's, what does that start to tell you about the Democratic Party at that point? Well, I mean, it's not too uh, dissimilar to what happened in my party. Uh, you know, on the ascension, everybody is unified in opposition. And then when you get the prize, uh, all of a sudden we need to even go further. Uh, and we'll, we'll see, you know, again, how long uh, uh, this internecine fight lasts within the Democratic Party. Uh, but I, I, I do think that it's applicable to our system on both sides. We are a binary system, one party or the other, given the structure we have under the Constitution and the Electoral College. Um, and I think because we have two parties, not more, um, those two parties have to absorb the fringes. And the fringes is where the intensity is. And the Democratic Party right now, the beating heart of that party is Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, AOC, and the far left socialist agenda. It's interesting that point you're making because even with the squad, she had, you know, famous stories about her, her back and forth with the squad. Here's these young progressives, and she was always the young progressive in the past, who come along and are more aggressive. And so there they starts to be a little bit of a break, and there's, there's, there's months of going back and forth be, about that. Um, does it, did that sort of start of a divide because of the young progressives coming in? remind you of, of any of your problems? Right. There, there's no question that there are a lot of analogies to the AOC Progressive Caucus and the Squad versus the Freedom Caucus and what had developed on the, on the fringe on my side. In the Democratic Caucus, I'm not so sure they have the hope, hope yes, vote no crowd. I know in the Republican uh, conference, we very much had individual members who were worried about their primaries and would vote no on bills they really wanted to pass just to cover themselves in the primary. And we saw that on big bills when I was in the leader position, when it came to the debt ceiling, when it came to funding of government, or a host of things that members who really, I think, wanted to see the government continue, but yet weren't willing to take that vote for risk of exposing themselves in a primary. Nancy Pelosi's caucus, they'll do that uh, they'll do that on political bills. They'll do that when it came to the reconciliation measure or the bipartisan infrastructure bill. The far left progressives will stand up and stop that. But we've not seen them stand up and stop the funding of the government, the extension of the debt ceiling. So there's a little bit of a difference uh, between what goes on on the two sides. Uh, and I also think one of the things that Nancy Pelosi has managed is this ability to be 80-some years old and still be speaker after being in D.C. 30, 40 years, whereas you know, the culture on the, on the Republican side is a little bit different. We have term limits for committee chairman. The assumption is when the party loses its majority that the leader of that party steps down. Uh, none of that has happened on the Democratic side. And somehow or another, Nancy's firm grip on her caucus uh, has been sustained. Maybe the next thing I'll ask you is, is the, the impeachment. So she's trying to keep her caucus together, and the progressives really want to go for impeachment. She's thinking it's never going to go through Senate. It, it's all it, it, it is is will make the base happy. Uh, but the problem is I got all these moderates uh, that we don't want to lose their seats or we want to take back seats that Trump had won over that were used to be Democratic. So she's between a rock and a hard place uh, as well. What, what, how did you see that situation? No, there, there's no question. I think Nancy is, is also, you know, she is a veteran politician in this town, and you always have to abide by the rule of 218. And she knew that the way that um, the Democrats found their way to the majority were in these suburban swing seats. Um, you know, and so um, you've, you've always got to be mindful of that, but yet you realize the overwhelming majority of your caucus uh, is not necessarily aligned with those swing seats that are the majority makers. 
workers. Uh, and it's a balancing act. And, and you know, Pelosi's had to, um, you know, sort of execute on that for many years. Uh, again, I think now, though, she's having a lot of difficulty uh, because the balancing act is so severe, uh, because the margins are just so slim, she has no room to maneuver versus when she first came into leadership, she could disregard two dozen people and still be fine. Uh, the State of the Union, February of, of, of 2020, um, Trump is coming vin feeling vindicated because it, it's at going to the Senate, it's, it's apparent now that he's gonna, they're not gonna you know, convict him. Um, but uh, he gives the Medal of Honor to Limbaugh and he sort of takes over the room. Um, Pelosi seems furious, and in the end, she, of course, rips up the speech behind the president. Well, how did you view that? What does that say about her? What, what's important to understand? Look, I, I don't think that her ripping up the president's speech was um, necessarily a surprise, given what I know about Nancy Pelosi. She is a fierce partisan warrior uh, and knew the crowd she was playing to. She knew where the base was. She knows how to ignite the intensity of the base. That was a brilliant move as far as the base, the activist base of the Democratic Party, including the activist base in her membership and her caucus. However, to most of us, it was disgusting and disdainful for her to do that in disrespect to the office of the presidency. But again, I talk about this a lot in my private life in the, in the private sector now, there is a very different game that politicians play in Washington. Nancy Pelosi is an artful player at that game. I mean, you got to give it to her. But there is absolutely um, a, a commitment uh, to a slash and burn partisan war warfare mindset that she has developed over the years uh, that doesn't make a lot of sense to most normal people in they go about their everyday lives. The, the irony, I mean, that the fact it happens on both sides that the, you know, the congressman who shouted out, you lie uh, during Obama's uh, speech to, to Congress. I mean, what's going on? Uh, again, the, you know, we, we have assumed now in our country the need to see elected leaders fight and maybe not even get a solution as long as they're fighting. And I think there are many, many causes to why we are where we are. I think our system uh, and our country maintains its leadership despite this sort of dysfunctionality that is descended upon Washington. Uh, but I do think there are many reasons why the activist base on both sides are more interested in the fight than they are necessarily in the outcome. January 6th, um, just talk to me a, l a little bit about um, how you viewed the actions of, of Pelosi at that point. She, she seems to feel that she has to stand in, in the breach. January 7th, she, she, she and, Pelo and, and Schumer call up um, the vice president and, and trying to get him to invoke the 25th Amendment. Um, she's talking to the Pentagon about you know, the, the, the safety of nuclear weapons. Um, she feels that the president is, is sort of only thinking about, you know, complaining about the election, and the vice president is sort of out of the picture at this point. She's next in line for the presidency. How do you view her th actions? Th th think about Nancy Pelosi's actions post-January 6th. I mean, I, too, was appalled by what I saw on January 6th. Um, I had written about it in the Washington Post about uh, what I thought was wrong with uh, even members of my side that uh, went along with this uh, this myth that somehow there could be a change in the outcome after the states had certified elections. But nonetheless, you had uh, Nancy Pelosi uh, as, as Speaker of the House assuming a role uh, that would perpetrate more division, that didn't respond to the moment to say, we are a bigger country than this. We are a model to the world. You know, we we are here for the people that put us here, not the activists who want to continue to see a brawl uh, unfold in Washington. She had no compunction about going in and even lighting it up further. I mean, she was as guilty of gaslighting the situation as any. Uh, so again, I think it is striking to me that le a leader like that would uh, ignore the opportunity 
uh, to try and be someone to bring folks back together. Again, I think it speaks to this very unyielding mentality that Nancy Pelosi developed very early on uh, to just assume the fight each and every day and fight harder and harder no matter what the situation because she plays by the rules in the halls of power in Washington, not by the sort of uh, rule of norm and decency throughout the country. The quotes from the Woodward, Wood, Woodward book is, she was telling people, um, the president's crazy. Uh, we have to do something. This is, this is my constitutional obligation. This is, this, is, this is hogwash. Nancy Pelosi um, saw the opening to have yet more of a fight to pour gasoline on what was already a burning, raging fire uh, to excite her activist base and help her members.